Okay, so the last uh, thing that we were looking at um, last week is uh, what do we mean by this uh, portable, right? We said uh, portable is this way of writing down uh, uh, correctness conditions about programs that includes uh, the precondition that has to be, uh, that has to hold, right? Some precondition that has to hold before you execute uh, the program, C, and then the post condition. See, it's, I, I sort of call it the program uh, because uh, in our the setting, um, program is also a single command, right? And uh, the idea is that uh, when we write down this word triple, all we are claiming is uh, if you execute this program under C, um, a program C under the precondition P, the post condition Q will hold, right? So, and uh, P and Q are the, um, have the type uh, heap or evaluation or a prop. Essentially, you can read this as uh, there are some conditions, there are some uh, propositions over heap and valuation, right? And uh, these heap and valuations are the um, sort of the heap and valuation that are present before the execution of this command and after the execution of this command, right? So this is what we have. So um, the cool thing about uh, uh, whole logic is that uh, it's syntax driven. So why this is uh, cool will uh, sort of uh, come into picture uh, in a bit. But really, uh, just like how we have uh, um, the operational semantics for each of the commands, we have whole logic uh, rules, whole triple rules that applies for each of the syntactic uh, forms that we have in our programs that precisely capture what goes on in that particular uh, um, command. And this is wonderful because uh, it allows us to decompose program behavior, reasoning behavior, by looking at the syntactic rule, right? Intuitively, this uh, this is very simple, right? So the way to read uh, each of these is that uh, if you start with some precondition P and you execute skip, then the same condition P holds in the post condition as well. This is very um, obvious, right? Because skip doesn't have any effect, Anything that you that holds before you start executing the command also holds when you finish executing that command, right? And similarly, uh, for sequencing, we are saying that if P holds, uh, uh, if the precondition P holds, then the post condition R holds, under the assumption that um, if you assume the precondition P holds and execute C1, you have some Q can pre -con post condition Q, right? And if you take that post condition and make that as a precondition for C2 and execute it, and uh, the post condition R holds, right? So sort of uh, threading this through, right? And uh, there we are assuming that there exists a intermediate uh, um, condition Q that sort of uh, bridges the um, gap between uh, C1 and C2, right? So you can you can imagine this to be an existential variable that uh, that is there. Okay, and uh, let's do, so the the one um, additional primitive that we've added to our language is uh, this assert primitive, right? Just to recall this assert, um, let's actually look at how assert executes, right? This assert says that uh, um, this assert will only reduce to um, a heap and evaluation if this assertion actually holds whatever A is, A is just a proposition that is written over H and V, it will only reduce if the assertion actually holds, right? So that is the operational um, manifestation of what assert is. It says if the assert holds, then the program executes. If the assertion does not hold, then the step is not defined. This is very similar to your program throwing an error and stopping at the point, right? Um, but what is the uh, whole triple notion of assert? We are sort of we are sort of saying how do you relate assert to the pre and post conditions that you might have in your program, right? So, so what we have here is uh, the way to read this is assume that you have some precondition p that holds before you start executing assert, right? And the assert itself is uh, some i, right? I is some proposition that you want to write. I might just say. At this point, the variable x is 25, right? And what do we expect, right? We expect that uh, this assertion, right, what I have written down is true. 
and uh, which just means that the precondition right the precondition must be strong enough the assumptions that you made about uh, the program state at that point must be strong enough to imply whatever i am asserting right the precondition could include lot of things you can say x is 25 y is y is 26 z is 27 but if the assumption says uh, i expect uh, x is 25 then the precondition must be at least as strong as uh, that is required to imply the imply the assertion right and that is what uh, we write down here and uh, and because we don't have any effect on the heap or the valuation the same p uh, is true when you execute one step of the assertion command right so the precondition p is the same as the post condition uh, as well okay so um any questions on on this so far? Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, so if uh, the post con uh, sorry precondition is x is greater than or equal to five, and yeah. i is x is equal to five, so it is strong enough to yeah. uh, yes, assert. that's right. Uh, uh, but no, no, no. Post... sorry. So um, that's not true, right? Uh, if uh, x is greater than or equal to five, that's 25. the precondition. Okay, fine. 25. Uh, if x is greater than or equal to 25, x is, uh, can be 50 as well, right? Um, x can be 50. The condition just yes. says x is greater than or equal to 25. Hmm. So if you have an assertion which says uh, x double equal to 25 here, that is not satisfied. The other direction... Uh, not be, double equal to, like assignment x equal to 25. Assignment uh, x equal to 25. So we are only doing assertion here, right? Okay. We haven't yet uh, okay. come to assertion assignment yet. So mm -hmm. I will, it's a good question. It's sort of following up to what uh, assignment, the property of assignment should be, right? So we will actually, what we are going to capture here is uh, we are going to show if you assume arbitrary precondition, what is the effect mm -hmm. of uh, assignment on uh, the heap and the valuation? I will explain it now. Okay. 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 I'll uh, I'll just explain it. So this rule is uh, quite big, right? In order to understand uh, how this comes about, uh, I have some notes uh, separately. So let me open that up. So yeah. Okay. So let me make this. Um, we hide the sidebar, then uh, we can zoom in and see. Okay. So we are sort of going to um, get to this uh, rule, right? So this rule looks, looks big. I'm sort of going to give you an intuition as to what we are trying to capture with uh, uh, that particular rule. So what whole logic is trying to capture is, uh, it is trying to capture the meaning of executing that particular uh, command, right? So we want to logically capture the meaning of executing that command. The meaning of executing that command is very easy, right? So when you read uh, x to y, I'm, the command itself I have example here is uh, I'm assigning uh, whatever the value of y into x. That is what I want to logically capture, right? And uh, let's say, for uh, example, the precondition that I have is this one here. What does that say? Um, as I mentioned before, our preconditions are uh, pre and post conditions are essentially functions, right? They take the heap and the valuation at that point. And then they, they they can be arbitrary propositions. This particular uh, precondition says that um, before you execute uh, this particular uh, uh, x assigned to y, my current state is um, x is 0 in the valuation, and the value of uh, y is 1. right? And when you execute this step, right, what happens? I'm getting the value of y and storing to x. And all it uh, will change is that. Um, uh, x will be 1, right? x will be 1 now, y will be the same thing, right? This is one, uh, this is perfectly fine. This is a perfectly fine definition of a suitable pre and post condition for this definition. It says that if you start with this particular example, then when you execute this uh, assignment statement, you end up with uh, this particular uh, post condition, right? So, um, I hope we understand this one, right? This this makes intuitive sense, right? So, um, okay, good. But 
this is not the most general form that we can actually arrive there are two deficiencies with this right the one thing it doesn't say is uh, um it is um, it is it is correct but it is not complete what do i mean by that it says that um, um it says only something about the value of x and y in the valuation if there is some z right it doesn't actually say what that value of z is here see this is some v this is also some v and the assumption is that uh, i am saying i am i am saying something about the properties of uh, v here right i am actually not saying anything about other variables here i have this other v here this v is not related to this, this v right and hence uh, because i don't mention say some random variable z z happens to be 20 here and it magically changed to 25 here right that cannot happen we know that cannot happen but this uh, particular the pre and post condition here does not suitably also cover those cases in particular you want to say that it doesn't change any other variable right and similarly i have a h here right i have h here even though i use the same variable name they are not related the he could have arbitrary things here it can have completely different things here right so i am not restricting the h such that uh, what i really want to say is that when you do assignment the the particular uh, heap does not change the assignment statement does not change the heap it only changes the valuation right for a general case you want to capture that for a specific case this is fine but for a general case you want to also capture the missing pieces of information which says that the only thing that you modify is the variable that you assign to and the value that you actually modify that to is the value of this expression on the right hand side and heap remains the same right that is where we want to get to so here is the uh, way we capture that right so this is the same as what i have here i just write down this whole thing that i have i'll just write call that p right p is a, a precondition a precondition is nothing but a function that takes heap and evaluation and it has some uh, proposition over those heap and evaluation let me call that p what do we want to capture about the assignment we know precisely that assignment doesn't change the heap we know precisely that the assignment only changes the value of the variable that is being assigned to right and hence we write the we capture the uh, meaning of uh, the assignment like this so if if you replace everything with p then the post condition will have some heap and valuation right and the way i write that is there exists some valuation v prime right um and uh, the idea here is to relate this v prime to this v and the way we relate that is the correct v here the v here is precisely just the v prime extended with the binding for x where x is bound to whatever the value of y is interpreted in h and v prime right what this is capturing is that uh, v prime v is exactly v prime except for uh, this uh, x binding whose value is the value of whatever y is right that is what uh, we have this interpretation is what we have seen earlier right it simply says that uh, the valuation the only thing that can change in that valuation is this uh, um, variable x right and the value that it changes to is whatever the interpretation of y is right <coughs> this arrow right how i actually capture this arrow is that um, i actually say that this should hold and we have to capture that uh, the heap also doesn't change right the way i capture that is i expect this property to hold if this is p i expect uh, p of h and v to hold right this h should be the same as uh, this h and the way i capture that is the precondition holds on the current h as well and uh, the v prime here the existential variable v prime so this is how i relate uh, this pre condition to the post condition here the whole thing is sort of q and q q this q refers to the p internally right and i sort of uh, restrict the shape of uh, what the h and uh, v can be actually i am i am precisely capturing that the only thing that you can change is the valuation and that too for the binding x right that is what i am capturing here 
If you sort of erase the detail, this uh, detail can be erased for the general case. If uh, if the precondition is p and you assign um, uh, to x some expression e, the result of expression e, then uh, the post condition is that for some h and v, which is the current heap and valuation, the current valuation is such that it takes this v prime, there exists some v prime, and all that changes is this x by, uh, binding for x, where uh, the value of uh, x is the interpretation, interpretation of e, and the precondition also holds on h and v prime, right? v prime is referring to the valuation here in this space, right? This arrow here. And it has to hold on the current heap as well. It has to hold on the current heap, so the heap actually doesn't change, is what we are uh, trying to capture, right? So that is what uh, this fully captures, this uh, this sort of uh, um, relation, this, this particular specification fully captures what uh, the assignment is doing. Right? And that is how we arrive at this uh, definition. So if you now switch back to our view here, you can see that I have a P here. Assuming some precondition holds in the post condition, oops, in the post condition, uh, there'll be some V prime. This V prime is the V prime, the valuation at this point, P of H V prime holds, and the valuation, new valuation here, is exactly the old valuation with the change for x, right? That's the that's the whole sort of uh, logic behind uh, O triple. It is uh, it is capturing the meaning of uh, the assignment construct here. This is a language that we implement, and we logically capture it fx using uh, a post condition, the relationship between the pre and post condition. Right? That's the key aspect that we have here. So for uh, does that make sense? I and mean, this is sort of uh, very crucial. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So if it makes sense, uh, then the heap assignment, right, is very similar, except that instead of changing the valuation, we are now going to change the value at the location in the heap, right? So. Um, Instead, what we do here, it looks very similar, right? Instead of changing the V prime, we are changing the heap here. So I am assigning to this uh, location E1, whatever location E1 evaluates to. So there must ex exist a H prime in the precondition, right? Where precondition H prime V holds and the heap, the new heap here is the old heap extended with the location at which uh, E1 evaluates to, right, has the value of uh, whatever E2 evaluates to, right? And both of these are observed that they are both on H prime, which they should be, right? We are now defining the new heap based on the old heap. So E1, E2 are interpreted in the old heap, and we get a new heap as a result. Okay, so that is uh, um, assignment to the heap. This is very similar to assignment uh, um, to variables. Okay, that's the assignment rule. Now we are coming to the if then else rule. So assume we have a precondition P, right? That's the arbitrary precondition. So in an if condition, there are two branches, right? You take the uh, true branch if B actually evaluates to true. So assume that uh, there exists a state S. Again, S is just a pair of H and V. I'm not expanding S just because I don't I don't use H and V separately. So for the precondition, I'm just saying there exists. When do we actually execute C1? Right? We execute C1 um, when the precondition holds and B evaluates to true. Right? That is when we evaluate uh, C1. So that is that is what I'm capturing in this precondition. Right? There is exists some state where the precondition holds on that state and this B, this Boolean expression, evaluates to true, right? In uh, the same state, then if you if you run C1, right? If you execute C1, you get a post condition Q1, right? Let's keep the Q1 on the side. The same for uh, C2, right? When do you execute C2? You execute C2 when the precondition holds, and 
the Boolean actually evaluates to false. So similarly, we have uh, lambda s, p s, precondition holds, and the Boolean expression evaluates to false. Then you execute C2. If you execute C2 in this precondition, then you get a Q2, right? These two can be um, different, right? So you can you can have arbitrary commands here. You can have arbitrary commands here. We can't relate these two. But when you, how do you actually state something about uh, the entire expression? All you can state is uh, uh, either Q1s or Q2s holds, right? These are uh, mutually exclusive actually because uh, we have this uh, either b holds or b does not hold so one of these things only will hold right um, this distinction usually is uh, not an exclusive or but really this is exclusive or because of uh, this uh, interpretation of b here so one of these will, will hold is what we can actually say about the post condition right so um, so yeah so that's uh, what we have for if then else this is a very handy rule, right? So this is called the rule of consequence. Um, the idea here is this, right? If you um, if you have, say, some P prime, right? Um, precondition P prime holds C Q prime, right? Um, you can arbitrarily um, strengthen. Um, actually, let's read through this, right? So. We can say that P prime C Q prime holds. If say P C Q holds, this this P and C P and Q are uh, arbitrary P and Q. What is the relationship between P and P prime Q and Q prime? You can you can sort of uh, uh, you can sort of take P prime to be a stronger condition, right? Stronger condition that implies P, and you can always take Q prime as a weaker condition. That is implied by Q. So what this means is that uh, um, you can um, you can arbitrarily strengthen your uh, uh, precondition. You can weaken your post condition, right? You can you can always say um, uh, because because of this implication property that you have, right? Uh, you can show that P prime. You can you can show show that P prime C Q prime holds if uh, really P C Q holds. Right, some PCQ holds. You can make that stronger, right? P prime is actually implying P, so P prime is actually stronger. You can strengthen your uh, preconditions, or you can weaken your post conditions, right? Um, you can always weaken your post condition to true. If your post condition says x is going to be 25, you can replace that to true because uh, x is equal to 25 implies true. Anything implies true, right? So this property will become um, uh, will come in handy. When we want to actually do um, proofs for larger things, when we want to connect uh, multiple things uh, together, um, and oftentimes we will just uh, do this uh, strengthen post condition, right? And um, and we will sort of the property that we actually want to show at the end might uh, actually be a weaker property than what we actually learned from the syntax of the program, right? So the syntax will express some complex. Uh, strong property right which implies a intuitive weak property so in order to connect these two properties uh, we sort of uh, use this rule of consequence right so we will end up uh, learning something very strong and we will actually relate that to the weaker property that we actually want to uh, the intuitive weaker property that we want to show you will see examples of this if this doesn't make uh, sense uh, directly we will we will look at examples it seems odd to have this but we will look at examples Okay, the one rule that I've uh, not covered here is the while rule, right? So as we've seen earlier, uh, while has this uh, loop invariant that is sitting here, right? We don't use this loop invariant in the operational semantics. And we said that we will come back to this loop invariant when we actually look at um, the whole logic triples. We are now looking at uh, what is the whole logic triple for the while, right? And it looks very complicated again. So we can actually derive, come slowly towards uh, this particular definition, right? So let's do that now. Um, so here is, uh, I'm going to switch back to my scribbles. So, okay. So let's let's ask what we want, right? Let me make it full screen. Sorry, not full screen, I'll just find it. Oh, 
it's already getting okay fine so i want to i want to write down the core logic triple which is assuming some precondition what is the post condition holds for the while construct right and uh, and here is the while construct right while b do c what does the while do while as long as the b is true it uh, keeps uh, executing c and when b is false it uh, terminates right so let's start with the case when b is actually false so consider b evaluates to false right if you assume that there is a precondition p what can you say about the post condition right the thing that you can say about the post condition is that uh, if p is the precondition you haven't actually evaluated the body at all you haven't executed the body so the same precondition will hold you haven't touched the heap you haven't touched the valuation because you've not executed anything here right you've just the completely skipped over c so the same precondition will hold and what else can you say it holds when uh, um, the b actually evaluates to false right so the interpretation of b under this s evaluates to false so negation of uh, this b holds right so that is the false case so when b b is actually false if you evaluate uh, uh, this program under uh, the precondition p then this post condition holds right that is uh, the false case of course we also want to capture uh, the case when uh, uh, the loop is uh, executed right so um, the condition holds and the program actually evaluates fully to uh, termination right because we are in big step semantics we can't reason about uh, non terminating steps we will come back to that later but we are going to reason about uh, the case when the branch is true and our and our loop actually terminates right now we are going to see what uh, uh, holds again let's assume that some arbitrary precondition holds right what holds about the post condition um the our loop has actually terminated that is what we are assuming here right and uh, because the loop has terminated it must be the case that uh, the b evaluated to false right and uh, we know what uh, the termination case is we have this uh, particular post condition here so we will copy that post condition here our loop actually terminated so that is what is here but we also happen to execute uh, the body of uh, the loop right and uh, the body of the loop is c and when do you execute the body we execute the body of the loop when the precondition holds on the state and the and the boolean expression is also true right the boolean expression is true uh, the precondition holds and uh, and now it executes and you get a post condition here is where things get interesting right so the fact that our uh, termination expects p to hold right when the loop terminates we expect p to hold we have we are sort of constrained and we have to restrict our uh, uh, post condition to also be p right this seems very odd c can have arbitrary effects right but we still want this post condition p to hold which is the same as what we expect for p right this this seems sort of backward right how can it be the case that uh, when you execute c you start from arbitrary p and you also happen to have the same p hold when you execute one step of c as well as at the termination this is precisely why um, loops are difficult right it is not that uh, the way to read this is it is not we are not saying what arbitrary p can be here we are actually restricting our p right this has to be a p such that it is it is actually invariant over the loop so this is the reason for the calling this loop invariant what do i call why do i what do i mean by invariant over the loop this p has to hold before you execute this loop this p has to hold while you are executing this loop this p also has to hold when you are uh, finished with executing this loop right so that is the so we are actually making it difficult we are actually restricting the shapes of p right the way to read this is uh, this this particular uh, whole triple on while holds only on those p such that 
the p is sufficiently invariant over the loop um uh the loop right so p holds at the beginning of the uh loop execution p holds while you are executing the loop p also holds while you are terminated when executing this loop the seems the seems sort of um, difficult but this is what we've done so far in our uh, proofs as well right if you sort of go back to how we proved the factorial or fibonacci we always had to do something interesting for the loop right we prove something for the loop separately loop body separately and then we sort of say okay now that we've done the hard proof we can now uh, do the easy proofs and we write these uh, complicated looking um, uh, specifications for how the loop body changes right if you remember how we did it for fibonacci i gave this lemma which is f of k is f of k plus 1 plus something else you prove this thing and then i will tell you that uh, the rest of the proof is simple that is where the clever bits actually are and uh, and yeah and that is uh, i mean we have to pick the p such that it is invariant over the loop right and uh, for our uh, encoding we actually pick uh, we actually make it a little bit uh, easy uh, for the syntax director thing um, what we claim is that uh, give us the invariant and attach it to the loop that you are going to uh, use right this can this can still be arbitrary p and what i say is this i has to be a property that is invariant over the entire loop so it holds at the beginning of the loop it holds during the execution of the loop it also holds uh, after the execution of the loop and the way i connect this p and post condition is that so the way to read this is this i while do c is part of the command right our command syntax actually includes that i so let's just uh, focus on that just so that uh, you know how to read this so observe that the command syntax actually includes this a as well this a is this i here right and what i'm saying is assuming arbitrary p right what is how do i capture the effect of the while loop it so this i is this loop invariant p must be strong enough to imply the loop invariant p can have other things stronger right it must at least imply the loop invariant right and then this is simply replacing i instead of p right now that we know that p actually implies i i can replace wherever the p is with i right i of s then uh, interpretation of b of s also holds then executing one step of c whole i because i is invariant right at the end again um, i of s holds right p of s holds here i replace uh, uh, p with i because p implies i and negation of uh, uh, b holds right we are actually terminated so um, so at the end of this uh, loop execution we know that uh, if you take the state of uh, whatever heap and valuation is this expression b evaluates to false right that is the general form that we have so we expect uh, this induction um this loop invariant this is also the induction hypothesis to be explicitly provided right so that is what we expect and uh, that is what uh, we have for the rule right so this rule is complicated because uh, of uh, for all the reasons that i just uh, mentioned now um and uh, the thing to remember is that uh, this i is actually a loop invariant right loop invariant holds true at the beginning during and the end of the loop this is closely related to the invariance in transition systems right whenever we come up with the inductive invariant there is a clever bit that is going on right and the same clever bit is what you need for this uh, loop invariant half the difficulty in using hor logic proofs for uh, these sort of loops is that you have to come up with this invariant which holds true at the beginning during the middle um during the execution and at the end and this loop invariant has to be strong enough that uh, it implies at the end of the day right you want to prove some intuitive property you may just want to say loop is sorted uh, sorry the program sorts uh, the input list it has to be strong enough to imply that as well so that's why there is a challenge here right loop invariant actually gives the induction hypothesis that i can that i can um, sort of use during the induction right that makes the correctness proof go through um yeah this is not syntax directed right so this is this only thing that sort of uh, has to be um 
rest of the rules are all sort of automatically applicable, right? If I just look at the syntax for arbitrary p, I can know what the post condition is. The only complex bit is this loop invariant. I can't just look at the body of the program and then come up with the loop invariant because it is usually more complicated than the structure of uh, what the syntax says. So loop invariant is this curious thing, right? Which is which is where the there is some air gap between the syntax and uh, the specification, right? Loop invariant is a specification. Here is a syntax. All of these are syntax directed. They're directly from the syntax. You can know what the pre and post condition specifications are. Here is where that falls apart, right? And that is why you need I. Actually, inferring a good loop invariant. If I just give you a program, a C program maybe, right? And I tell you what is the loop invariant for this program, right? You can always infer true, right? That is not a useful thing because true holds at the beginning, true holds in the middle, true holds at the end. So an open area of research is uh, given a program. What is a infer the loop invariant? So we expect here the in invariant to be explicitly provided as part of the program. So open research area is how to come up with uh, the loop invariant automatically so that uh, you can prove the arbitrary properties that you want to prove at the end of the day. Right? I want to prove that uh, this merge sort program or a quick sort program or a bubble sort program actually sorts. I know the specification of sorting because we've seen what a sorted list is. But the loop is doing something complicated, right? So I want to capture that property. It is hard to write it down. As you will see, coming up with a good loop invariant is not easy, right? We've seen this with the inductive uh, invariant as well. So an open area of research is how to actually infer a good loop invariant. By good, you just want that invariant to be inductive. You also want that invariant to imply your intuitive uh, post condition that you want to sort of uh, do. That's an active area of research. And the sort of lines that people take is, uh, in general, this problem is uh, very difficult. So can we restrict the language? Is there a small subset of the language and subset of uh, the specifications that you can write so that we can do some of this uh, tricks? So it's a really interesting, challenging um, area. I don't work on that, but uh, but it's uh, I understand that uh, there is a lot of progress that is made uh, on this. And uh, this is necessary. Actually, there are open source tools right, that uh, do it uh, at scale. Um, Facebook has this uh, tool called Infer. You can, it's an open source tool that uh, happens to be implemented in OCaml. It, it uses advanced uh, type theoretic techniques, similar to whole triples and whatnot we've seen here, in order to detect uh, um, null pointer exceptions statically. Right? So your post condition is that there should be no null pointer exception. But if you have a loop that is complicated, uh, loop that is uh, manipulating pointers, references, essentially, you want to say something about it. There, you don't want uh, the, the, the goal there is uh, the Facebook uh, developer sort of writes some Java code. They will send it to this tool. right? And the tool tries to come up with these invariants automatically in order to prove or disprove that uh, um, a particular uh, program does not have null pointer exceptions, right? So they use some advanced techniques there. You can play around with the tool, right? The tool is uh, open source and it is actually used by a number of companies, including Uber, for their production code, right? So um, one thing that is uh, really important is we are studying all of this theory, right? When you actually connect it to practice, there is a lot of software engineering constraints that come in. So you don't want to when you do um, when you do these sort of techniques, a lot of these techniques bring in uh, many false positives as well, right? So you don't want the tool to uh, capture all of the um, safety properties, but also produce lots and lots of false positives. If you produce lots of false positives, then uh, the the developer, right, who doesn't have, who might not have a good understanding of uh, um, how the proof uh, system works. We'll just see like 100, uh, 100 uh, uh, warnings, and maybe one or two of that uh, is a real bug. Then it is not a good use of their time. So you have to reduce the false positives, right? But uh, you may lose soundness, right? If the, if the tool cannot find a bug, doesn't mean that the tool uh, certifies the program does not have a bug. It just says that I've done my due diligence. I have not found a bug. So 
deploying these sort of program verification techniques at scale is something that uh, Facebook Infer Group has done very well. Uh, I'll share you some uh, nice articles that they've written. So Peter O'Haran is, uh, um, is a prof used to be a professor at uh, UC, UCL. Um, and then he sort of worked on uh, Hoare logic and uh, extension of Hoare logic, which we will not study, called separation logic. He developed a separation logic along with a few other uh, people. And then they use separation logic at scale, right? So they, they sort of uh, um, run this as a bot, GitHub bot, um, for all of the code that uh, a Facebook uh, user commits. So the way they do that is uh, they will commit some code. The bot will kick up, do the static analysis, and comment on uh, uh, the PRs and uh, commits saying there are null pointer exceptions here, warnings here. You, most often, um, what will happen is that uh, developer time is also important, right? If they commit something and then they have to week, wait, a, wait a week to get the results out, that is also not uh, something that uh, you want to do. So they will, I mean, the, uh, the sort of concerns that they have are uh, you, want the, you want the responses from the bot within, say, half an hour, right? Which is like a typical, you go for lunch, you come back, and then you want the results to be there. You don't want it to be like two hours. Two hours is not a good uh, metric. So one thing that Peter O'Haran um, says in, in that uh, um, software engineering side of doing verification at scale is that uh, there are only three kinds of, uh, um, maybe a few kinds of uh, um, time timelines for verification tools, right? It is either instantaneous. So you click a button, it instantly comes back and says, Yes or no. So instant instantaneous feedback is something that uh, say OCaml okay, type checker gives you. you. Click compile, it will complain yes, it is uh, true or not. Or you have this uh, timeline for coffee, right? It has to come back within like 15 minutes. You go for a coffee, you come back, you you would have started this build uh, before that. When you come back, you will have the results. That is fine. Or it is like one hour, right? Um, you do some analysis, it will take one hour. So the so the programmer developer says, okay, I'm going to run this thing. Goes to lunch, comes back, and after lunch he will see the reports. Or the thing is uh, nightly ones. So end of day, you say I commit this. In the morning when you come back, you take some eight hours to run these tests. But in the morning it has to be there. Anything else doesn't work, right? If you if you say two hours, it is as good as uh, doing nightly things, because uh, the developer just won't bite it. So there are some interesting lessons about application of uh, all of this to real world software engineering, right? So I will find, uh, I'll, I'll share you the articles uh, on Slack later. So anyway, so let's uh, stop that uh, digression. Let's move on to why Hotriple is so nice, right? And Hotriple is sort of um, the, um, serves, serves as the fundamental building block for lots of different sort of automated verification tools. Firstly, it handles uh, um, imperative languages, right? We are not just uh, doing functional languages. Real programs today uh, happen to be imperative, so you want to be reasoning about that. So Ho triple sort of gives you a way, way into reasoning about uh, imperative languages, right? Secondly, it, it uh, provides a path towards uh, automated verification, right? So here is a simple strategy, right? So let's say you want to prove that uh, under this post condition, Q, this uh, this post condition is my intuitive property. I have a program. I might write a sorting program. I have a specification for sortedness. We know how sortedness works, right? It is every element should be less than or equal to uh, the next element in the list. I have a complicated program. My precondition might just say this is an element, uh, this is a list with some elements, right? It might be very weak. How do I automatically verify that uh, the program actually satisfies the sortedness specification? So here is a strategy, right? And the strategy is this. So there is uh, the observation is that uh, there is a syntax-driven rule here, right? So all of these rules are syntax-driven. So you look at the syntax of the command, you actually can know what the post condition is, right? And similarly, we, we say something about loop invariant, but essentially, if you consider this to be syntax also, we actually know how to get the post condition, right? By looking at the syntax. So the first observation is, 
if q unifies with the syntactic rule for c one of the syntactic rules for c you actually say okay that is that is fine and you recursively go ahead and uh, proceed with the premises of c what do i mean by this if my program is actually composed of uh, c1 semicolon c2 my post condition is exactly r whatever that r is it pattern matches with r you simply say that uh, okay now i can just uh, unify this my proof obligations will be these two things i will recursively go through right similarly for this one if it perfectly unifies then it go through often times as you can see right this won't unify because this is saying something very strong about uh, this particular statement so what do you do when it does not unify you apply the rule of consequence right you make the uh, strengthen the post condition so instead of uh, just pcq you strengthen the post condition to some q prime right such that q prime implies q this is an existential uh, unification variable right so you leave this as a unification variable and now you go back to syntax application because it's a unification variable it will unify with uh, one of the syntactic rules right and uh, this part of the proof will go through you can you can repeatedly do this what you will be left with is a bunch of uh, side conditions like this one prove that q prime implies q and then other other r prime implies r and so on and the idea here is to actually discharge those with smt solver so you can just encode those in smt and make it uh, go through right that is the way by which lot of the verification rules for say c are built so there is a syntax driven part which is what hor logic provides right it also has this rule of consequence that let us uh, strengthen the post condition right and we use that to bridge the gap between the syntactic rule and the weaker post conditions that we might have right? so all of these will be discharged by syntactic rule you will just be left with uh, a bunch of uh, conjunctions where each of those are implications such as this and we will use smt solver to tools use smt solver to make it go through because we are going to be studying this in pop we will build a small tactic i won't explain the details but it's a small solver that knows about um, um arithmetic and the boolean expressions right we will see how powerful that is uh okay so we will see that the one thing that um, um i want to tell you is that uh, there is this notion of soundness with uh, four triples and uh, what is soundness and why do we need it this sort of connects the whole triple with the operation semantics right so if you look at um, the operation semantics here which is here and the whole triple here we don't actually use uh, the big step evaluation right this down big down arrow we don't stay state that here but we understand that that is it, it is implicitly related right every rule here sort of has the same structure as the rules that you might see here but what is the formal connection between the whole triples and uh, the operation semantics here another way of uh, looking at the same question is uh, use the analogy right so for type systems we had uh, for lambda calculus we had this uh, analogy where we said uh, you have the command right you have the types for those commands and we sort of connected those two by saying that if a command is uh, if a program is well typed then uh, that program will not uh, get stuck right um so that is a soundness uh, property for uh, uh, simply type lambda calculus right we said uh, well type programs do not crash here we have a similar statement so what we are claiming is that um, if we have uh, um the four triple right p c q right and uh, under some h and v the command the program c actually evaluates to h prime v prime right that is the actual execution of the program and the precondition actually holds on h and v we are trying to relate this h and v and h and v right so we have this uh, uh, whole triple here we are saying if the program evaluates to h prime v prime and the precondition holds then core logic soundness says that the post condition also holds right so this is the intuitive intuitive definition that we been talking about but this formally connects the big step evaluation h prime v prime to 
the post condition that you might have here. Right? So just like how we connect types to the programs, uh, Lambda Calculus programs, we are connecting the four triple, the properties that we state here to the execution of the program. Right? So that is uh, what we call the uh, soundness of uh, for logic. The soundness proof actually goes through um, like very simply. Uh, so we won't deliberate too much on this, but keep um, be aware that uh, we have to explicitly connect the whole logic, even though they appear very similar. We have to connect the whole triples to um, the execution semantics, right? So even though the whole triples look uh, like they are capturing execution semantics, we have to explicitly prove it, and we do prove it. And we will come back to that. I will stop here. In the next class, what we will do is we will look at uh, the um, rules in Cock, and we will actually use the um, this principle to actually prove simple programs, right? And we will start doing more and more complicated programs uh, using core logic, and um, and yeah, and we'll do that uh, through this week. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Bye bye.